that abortion took place in the past. Some of them go back 20, 30 years or more. And cells were taken from the fetus, cultured in a petri dish, caused to generate themselves in large quantities. And then when these continue to generate themselves over time, they're called a line. There are a number of vaccines in common use that have this connection that parents use with their children. The chickenpox vaccine does not have a good alternative. Other vaccines that are used in childhood diseases do. So you have to look around and it, it is the wish of the Vatican that we inquire about these vaccines and whenever it's available to use those that have no connection to abortion whatsoever. If you ask that question to your average medical practitioner who's giving your child a vaccine, do they even know the answer to that question typically? No, they don't. They will be surprised and some will say, oh, that can't be true. And others will investigate and say, well, I didn't know this. I'm going to recommend a good website for you. Now, this is an organization called Children of God for Life. And they have a list of vaccines and whether they're good or bad and whether the bad ones have alternatives. We don't really endorse this organization. We don't endorse any organizations, but this is the best list that we have found on the internet. This looks like it, yes. So there's a list of all the different vaccines and it says product name, manufacturer, fetal cell line, ethical version. So this would be a fairly easy way to look up and see if you are getting a vaccine and you can request the ethical vaccine from your doctor or find out which one they're using. It looks like there's a few on here real quick that you said chicken pox, acute respiratory disease, and there's a vaccine for severe kidney disease. There is no ethical version. So if there is no ethical version, is it ethical for a Catholic to use that vaccine? This was looked at by the Vatican back in 2008 in a document called Dignitas Personae in paragraph 35, which talks about using biological materials of illicit origin. And of course, the Vatican is morally concerned and strongly opposed to the use of any aborted fetal material or embryonic stem cells to produce cell lines. It also recognizes that there are different degrees of responsibility for the wrongdoing that's happened here. The uh, researcher who was standing by when the abortion took place and took some cell tissue from the lung of the aborted fetus and then began the cell line, which is, this is how they did it. They had to be standing at the ready. He's obviously done something completely wrong. The cell line begins, then you have manufacturers and others who are using the cell line for their products. And again, that is something that shouldn't be happening. Then from there, you've got uh, the people who are marketing it. They're further removed from the original wrongdoing. And then finally, you've got the physician who is offering it and the parents, let's say, or adults who are uh, using it. But the Vatican, reflecting on this, recognizing that the moral fault really lies elsewhere, it essentially says that these can be used when there's no alternative, under protest, for the time being until such product becomes available that has no connection. One of the documents that was produced by the Vatican in this area by the Pontifical Academy for Life some time ago, this is in a previous pontificate, talks about uh, rubella in particular, and is pretty harsh in its judgment of those who would refuse this particular product because of the risks they are subjecting others to within society. We do have a social obligation to others, you know, love others as you would love yourself. There's a, a mandate there for us to take care of our own health so that we don't transmit serious diseases to others or cause other people harm. Back to COVID-19, what's the Catholic Church doing right now to try to encourage and make sure that the vaccine that's developed is developed from ethical sources? There is an organization that is housed at the Catholic University of America, which is doing research on a non-compromised, let's put it that way, COVID-19 vaccine. But the challenge is that these cells are in such widespread use that the researchers pick them up automatically and start using them again. In the area of COVID-19, there's probably maybe two dozen companies that are working with proper cell lines and proper starting tissues. 
and then another 15 that are on the bad side, which are using these either old cell lines or perhaps experimenting with something new. I don't know, but there are both types out there. Certainly the Catholic community is encouraging researchers to use the good materials for the vaccine. Stem cell research, that became quite the thing under the Bush administration, understanding the difference between, of course, adult-derived stem cells and embryonic stem cells. Is that still an issue today? And what, what can you tell us about that issue today? The problem is, of course, that you have to kill an embryo to get an embryonic stem cell. The political scene has changed considerably since the days of George Bush. His restrictions on federal funding was followed by the Obama administration, which opened the door to anything and everything. We are back under the Trump administration to a, a restrictive environment, but still private companies can make use of embryonic stem cells uh, in their research, and they continue to do so. It's interesting because there's not been a lot of success with embryonic stem cells. It's been hugely expensive. We've also discovered other cells, pluripotent stem cells, which have the same properties as the embryonic, but don't have the same moral concerns because they are cells taken from an, a, an adult, I guess you'd say, you could also say from a child, but they are cells from a, a not an embryo, and they're kind of regressed. You, you back them up to an earlier primitive state, but they never get to the pure embryonic state. So these have many of the same properties and are working uh, quite well and there have been important advances in this line of research. What are some other big areas of unethical research that Catholics need to be aware of? Of course, we've got the whole abortion industry in this country, and there's been recent exposés by Dan DeLayden and others showing that they've been selling fetal aborted tissue. Planned Parenthood just got the, like a $2.1 million judgment against the Leyden's organization. So we've got some real high level political battles with a lot of money at stake uh, over the whole abortion industry. So that's certainly one of the big areas. I have seen brochures put out by people who are promoting this kind of thing. They're kind of discreet. You don't see them very often openly shown, but giving them to women who are going to have abortions and saying, well, look, you can get some good out of this, even though you're having an abortion. You know, just call this number and we'll, we'll take tissues and we'll try to use them for a good medical research. Of course, that's completely wrong. No woman should ever agree to do that. But it gives you a, a sign and an indication of how these researchers really are amoral. They're just anything they can get their hands on. And in fact, the order lists that are put before Planned Parenthood actually ask for different body parts and they will change the abortion procedure to make sure that they get whole organs when they remove the child through uh, the abortion process. So you're from the National Catholic Bioethics Center. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you, what you do and show your website or anything like that to our listeners? The National Catholic Bioethics Center, it's uh, www.ncbcenter.org. One of the most unique things about our organization is that we have a consultation line Anybody with a moral question connected to medicine is free to call us or send us an email. We do consultation services, and we, uh, we answer those questions for our calls. We get many in the area of end-of-life care, nutrition and hydration, do not resuscitate orders, patients at the end of life who are struggling with pain and the like. So that's a great service that we do to the, the public, the Catholic layperson. My own area is in publications, so I'm in charge of the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly. This is a quarterly journal for scholars, and also I'm in charge of Ethics and Medics, which is a monthly bulletin. It's a somewhat down-to-earth approach to the same sorts of questions, more for the general reader. We have a Department of Education that does a certification program in bioethics. We have podcasts, we have public policy statements, we have many resources that we post on our websites. All right, terrific. So I really appreciate you taking the time to discuss vaccines and other ethically problematic biomedical research today. I'm sure we all learned a lot. So thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it being here. And I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners for tuning in on this episode of our Being Pro-Life series. 
Head to the website and view all the links talked about in this episode at www.catholiccincinnati.org slash being-pro-life. Thank you again for joining with us today, and I look forward to being with you next time.